This is Commander Nunez reporting from the Challenger Center for Space Science Education in Alexandria, Virginia. On March 18, 2008, NASA astronaut Scott Parazinski gave an exclusive interview to Challenger Center for Space Science Education's founding chairman, Dr. June Scobie Rogers. This vodcast is part of an exciting new series of Challenger Center interviews with NASA astronauts and other acclaimed scientists and explorers. The goal of the new series is to introduce important role models to children and those young at heart. This interview is also available as a podcast on the Challenger Center website, www.challenger.org. And now for part one of the exclusive interview with Scott Parazinski. Before we begin with the questions, I just want to thank you. You uh, brought your flag that you flew to space back to our Challenger Learning Center in Houston. I've been associated with that museum and the Challenger Center there for uh, several years now, but I'd never taken a mission uh, before, and so I was... Uh, kind of an extra crew member on uh, on a mission to Mars, and it, it was really thrilling. Um, and I was, I was really impressed with the uh, uh, the aptitude and, the, you know, the problem-solving of the kids. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> they all want to be astronauts like you, Scott. <laughs> I think they'll be better than I was, but uh, <laughs> they have a lot, of, a lot of talent for sure. We want to begin the series of uh, podcasts interviews by asking you uh, what you were first. You did something that everyone would be curious about, first of its kind. Will you tell us a little bit about when, when you flew and what did you do that was the very first? Well, first of all, let me just uh, uh, say thank you for inviting me to join uh, this podcast. I'm, I'm honored to uh, be part of this, uh, this series and to be included in uh, the company of others uh, that I uh, high regard. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been very fortunate in my career to have flown uh, five times. I was selected in 1992, and uh, last fall I, I flew my, my fifth and uh, probably my final uh, mission is into space, uh, at least if you ask my wife. She'll tell you it, it was my last flight. <laughs> but one of the things that uh, happened on the mission, it was a, it was a incredible thing. We uh, had uh, a module that we were delivering in on the space station, a lot of spacewalking work to do associated with that. And then another major activity was to relocate a, a large uh, array truss from the top of the space station out to the very end. And that in itself was probably another full mission's worth of content. Then we had a number of other activities, basically two other uh, spacewalks to do as well. So the baseline plan was to do five spacewalks on this mission and, and spend 14 or 15 days in space at the station. And so it was a a wonderful challenge just going into it. Uh, however, uh, about uh, eight days in, as we had completed our relocation of the solar array truss uh, and we were deploying the solar array panels at, at the very tip of the space station, a huge uh, uh, was formed as, uh, as tangled guide wires uh, got caught and, and ripped apart some of the kind of accordion like uh, panels on the, on the solar array. This is a really big deal because uh, the entire space station assembly sequence counted on the power of the solar arrays, and in fact, it wasn't really safe for us to undock and then plan on docking another space shuttle. Uh, the next flights were to bring up international partner laboratories, and this was a, a huge ripple effect in the, in the whole space station program. And uh, so within 72 hours, brilliant people on the ground came up with a, a corrective action plan. They invented something that we, we now call cuffs to uh, stabilize the solar array and uh, develop special tools for me to go out and work on this still energized solar array panel. It had about 100 uh, volts of power uh, going through the, the array as, uh, as I was out working on it. And we were going out to a place that had never you know, anticipated being a, an EVA work site. Uh, it was uh, a 90-foot boom using the, the space station's robotic arm and then also our robotic inspection boom. And uh, it was really a, a dramatic uh, uh, experience to be out in a place that we never uh, planned on sending a, an astronaut, a suited astronaut, to go work. It really was treated with a, a God's eye view. Very fortunately, the tools that I had with me and the and the cufflinks uh, all worked extremely well, and we were able to uh, cut out that frayed wire and, and stabilize the solar array and then uh, fully deploy it. So the whole 
assembly sequence of the space station kept back and we were able to come back very, very successfully. So it was, a, I think, a real triumphant moment for, for NASA to come up with this and then be able to execute it. We were all on the edge of our seats waiting for the evening news to hear about success of your uh, solar array repair. Um, you were a major hero. We were all watching uh, because we knew it was dangerous and we knew how important that effort was. Were you ever afraid like uh, we imagined that you must have been? Uh, I was just kind of the, the guy at the, the very end of the sequence that uh, made it uh, come about. I, I don't consider myself uh, heroic in any any stretch. That's uh, it, nice of you to say, but uh, I, I had a, a job to do, and uh, as a professional, I went out and, and did the very best uh, that I could. I, I think the... The, uh, the engineers and the, the folks in mission control considered the, the risks out there, and, and there were some. It was uh, working on a live solar array. Um, it was further than we'd ever gone before, so an emergency bailout, if you will, was a little bit harder to, um, to manage. would have taken longer to get to the safety of the airlock had something happened to my spacesuit. But um, we had plans to uh, basically insulate all of the tools that we were using to work on the, on the solar array. We had practiced uh, um, uh, inside with some of the tools. Uh, we had reviewed a lot of the robotic trajectories uh, on our laptop computers inside the station before going out. We had several video conferences with experts on the ground before uh, in the spacewalk, so I actually went out with a, a lot of confidence <clears throat> in the plan that we we're going to to go uh, do. I, I think that the biggest fear I had uh, this will sound maybe a little silly, but um, I the biggest fear I had was uh, the fear of letting uh, um, all the folks on the ground down. That they had come up with all this you know, brilliant development work and it had all gone so perfect, uh, you know, developing the uh, robotic trajectories and the tools and, and people, you know, uh, Peggy Whitson and, and George Zamka inside the, the and fabricated these uh, these cufflinks to exacting specifications and you know everybody on the entire crew and, and many many people had done a lot of work and so I, I felt a, a little bit of uh, uh, extra pressure floating out there that day. We're proud of you, Scott. Hi. Was there ever an opportunity that you can remember that you were first to accomplish something or that you got an award for being best at? Well, you know, I, I, I guess my approach in life has always been um, if there's something that I'm that's worth doing, uh, I had to try and do the best I can at it. And so, uh, you know, I was uh, an athlete and uh, um, involved in you know, some student government and outside curricular activities and so I always uh, applied myself to the fullest, and I think what's most important for kids to realize is it isn't if you, you, know, you get the gold medal or uh, you become class president or um, get the trophy or what have you, but as did your very best, the, the rewards are, are immeasurable. Um, so, yeah, I, along the way, I've, I've, I've done you know, quite well in school and in my Outside the activities, but I haven't always, I haven't always, you know, been the best. At, I certainly, you know, apply my full concentration and energy at the things that you know I, I'm interested in, the things I love. And and like all of us, I uh, assume that somewhere along the way you had failures or disappointments. And mm -hmm. students, I want to be aware that they, uh, um, when they look to someone like you as a hero. Um, I think they assume that your ring in life has been perfect for you to arrive at this uh, time in your life. They would be well, interested and, to know that, that that's not always true. That, yeah, that's that's so well said, June. You know, um, you know there there are uh, failures and, and uh, you come up short, um, and you just keep you get back in the game and you, and you try harder next time and. And uh, you get rewarded for it. And even in failure, you know, the things that you learn along um, are are fantastic. And the people that you meet, and uh, you know, it opens up opportunities that you, you can't even imagine. That I tell young folks all the time when I visit schools and 
you know, places like the Challenger Centers. Um, it's it's important not only to make dreams, but to have the courage to make them come true. If you're not willing to um, work for them uh, and hold on to them, then they're certainly not going to be there. So you have to, um, have to really apply yourself. You may not get your your ultimate dream, but uh, you know you sure will get uh, you know wonderful rewards in the long run. So persistence is the key, isn't it? Absolutely.